What if the entire world that we live in was being controlled from outside? What if everything was an illusion run by a computer? It's manipulated us so skillfully that we'd never realize the truth. All of this so that except for an elite few, the populace would be blissfully living in an illusion of the perfect world. Or rather, the perfect prison. Megazone 2-3 was a four-part OVA series released between 1985 and 1989, produced by AIC, the studio behind Bubblegum Crisis. The story of Megazone begins in the present, the mid-1980s, where the main character Shogo Yahagi is given a futuristic motorcycle by his friend Shinji. Before Shinji can explain where the bike came from, him and Shogo are attacked by men in suits, inevitably killing Shinji. Shogo soon learns that the motorcycle can transform into a mecha called the Garland Unit and that it's part of a government conspiracy in which everything humanity sees and hears is an illusion, created by a supercomputer. Shogo discovers that he doesn't live in the 1980s, but rather hundreds of years in the future, and that mankind exists with their city harbored aboard a spaceship, controlled by the supercomputer Bahamu. The story culminates in a battle between Shogo and the government, ending with no true victor. Megazone went through many stages and iterations before its release. Initially, Megazone went into production as a 26-episode TV series titled Omega City 2-3. AIC had high hopes for the series, and hired the team behind the Super Dimension Fortress Macross to work on it. This included director Noboro Ishiguro and animator Toshihiro Horano, who was promoted to the position of head character designer, as Haruhiko Mikimoto, who did the character designs for Macross, would design the character Eve as well as secondary characters. AIC's plan was to capitalize on the popularity of Japanese motorcycle culture, following in the footsteps of Genesis climber Mospita and Aura Battler Dunbine, which both premiered the year prior in 1983. Omega City 2-3 followed a boy named Sotaru, who rode on a hoverbike similar to the one seen in the Super Dimension Cavalry Southern Cross. One day, Sotaru's friend leaves him a special hoverbike, in a scene similar to the Megazone scene between Shogo and Shinji. Just like in Megazone, the bike could transform into a robot, leading to the discovery of a government conspiracy. The Omega City story was eventually scrapped for a new concept, titled Vanity City. Vanity City was similar to Omega City, but introduced the idea of a female DJ running a pirate radio station, similar to the character Eve in Megazone. On a side note, the concept for this came from an unused idea for the Macross movie Do You Remember Love? In the original draft of the screenplay, there was a subplot about the character Minmei being kidnapped by the Zentradi. The government tries to cover up the abduction by using holograms to stage performances. You can actually see traces of this subplot in the finished movie, when Hikaru and Misa return to Earth to see a large hologram of Minmei performing in the city. After Vanity City, the project was refined and retitled as Omega Zone 2-3. At this point, the team had begun animating the series, and TV station Fuji TV had agreed to give the series Genesis Climber Mospita's time slot, as the show was preparing for its finale. It's important to know that when an anime is produced, the episodes aren't animated in order. Climactic action scenes and key character and plot introductions are usually animated first, so that they can compile those shots into a trailer and show them to advertisers for additional funding. Unfortunately, in the case of Megazone, the company AIC and Artmic lined up to produce the toy line for Omegazone backed out of their deal just as production began. With the toy deal cancelled, Fuji TV dropped the show from their lineup, essentially cancelling Omegazone. This put AIC in a hard place, as they had already made far too great of an investment in already completed animation. In order to recoup their losses, AIC made an unusual decision. They decided to have the team complete Omegazone as a 90-minute feature as opposed to a 26-episode series. The team got to work shortening the scope of the story presented in the first 13 episodes. However, the deflated budget led to the removal of key scenes, resulting in various plot holes and scenes of characters just acting illogically. With the project now going straight to video, the studio encouraged the addition of greater violence and a sex scene. This was to encourage sales, since the straight-to-video anime market at the time was almost exclusively reserved for explicit erotic titles. After six months of stressful work, Megazone 2-3 was released on video on March 9, 1985. On its release, the art style piqued the interest of many anime fans, noting the similarities to Macross. But unlike Macross, Megazone contained intense scenes of action and nudity unlike any other mainstream anime at that time. Many anime fans would go on to erroneously claim that Megazone was the first OVA, and the reason for that mistake is because prior to Megazone, the only non-pornographic OVA released was Mamoru Oshii's Dalos, which was a commercial failure. After the release of Megazone, OVAs exploded in popularity, with Megazone itself selling over 200,000 copies in its first year, making AIC their money back and then some. 
Many Japanese animators would turn to OVAs in the late 80s and 90s as a way to produce TV quality animation without the hassle of editing their stories to fit TV standards or promote toy sales. This led to the creation of what would be considered some of Japan's most powerful and memorable animated works. These OVAs would also have a huge impact on English-speaking anime communities in North America and Europe. That was because TV animes were usually around 25 to 50 episodes long, and Japanese tapes had to be purchased individually through retail importers. These tapes usually only contained two episodes at most, and since Japan had switched over to Laserdisc as their primary home media format, VHS tapes were even harder to find, with retailers charging around 60 to 100 US dollars for a single tape. On the other hand, an OVA consisted of an entire self-contained story on a single tape, making these tapes incredibly popular among early anime groups. With such a successful release and the story left open-ended, AIC decided to do a sequel to Megazone, allowing writer Hiroyuki Hoshiyama to give the series a proper ending based on his original script. Director Noboro Ishiguro was asked to come back and direct. However, AIC was in the midst of a lawsuit following an embezzlement scandal with one of their producers. Ishiguro saw this as a sign of bad things to come and declined to return, though he did recommend his friend and former Macross animator Ichiro Itano for the position. Itano had done very little directing at the time, but was a skilled animator, and is probably best known as the creator of the animation technique, the Itano Circus, seen in many early mecha shows. Since Hoshiyama knew ahead of time that what he was making would be released as a movie, he had plenty of time to streamline the story for the final 13 episodes into a feature film runtime. Character designer Yasuomi Umetsu, known for creating the Kite series, was brought on as the secondary character designer in place of Mikimoto. While designing the secondary characters for Shogo's Biker Gang, Umetsu decided to also do iterations of the main cast and showed them off to Aitano. Aitano loved his designs, and loved them so much that he decided to change the designs of all the characters in the film to fit Umetsu's style. Hirano and the rest of the staff were furious, calling this change illogical and confusing. But Aitano defended his decision, and often had to defend Umetsu, who was hated by most of the staff at this point. Part 2 concluded the story with Mankind returning to Earth and the antagonist BD freeing Mankind from Bahamut's false reality, giving a definitive end to the series. Noboro Ishiguro called this installment a chaotic mess, and fans were in fact confused by the new character designs. However, despite its criticisms and shortcomings, Part 2 still managed to make its money back and was a financial success. Having pulled off two miracles, AIC, Artmic, and all of the companies and staff involved finally decided to put the stress of Megazone behind them. That was until 1988, when AIC would decide to revive the series for less than reputable reasons. Stop! In July of 1988, Akira premiered in Japanese theaters. The film follows a boy named Kanida, the leader of a biker gang, who accidentally uncovers a horrifying government conspiracy. The film was a massive hit, stunning audiences worldwide, going on to leave a lasting impact on both the film and animation industry. Shortly after the release of Akira, AIC realized that they too owned the rights to a sci-fi property set in the future with a main character who was the leader of a biker gang and rode around on a futuristic red motorcycle while uncovering a government conspiracy. And so began production on Megazone 2-3, Part 3. Part 3 was set hundreds of years after Part 2, where humans have recolonized Earth. This was done to allow for the setting of a cyberpunk city, similar to Akira's Neo Tokyo. With the exception of Bahamut's AI Eve, none of the characters from Parts 1 or 2 make appearances, and neither Ishiguro, Itano, or Hirano would return for the project. Part 3 was released in Japan as two separate parts in September and December of 1989, both of which were panned by critics and fans alike, as many saw the film as a hastily thrown together cash grab. In the US, many were unaware of the studio's intentions when producing Part 3, though it was still reviewed less than favorably, as the story was riddled with plot holes and featured animation of much lower quality than Parts 1 and 2. Parts 3 and 4 effectively ended the series permanently, though in the minds of many fans, the series had already ended at Part 2. Interestingly enough, Megazone would make its way to the US multiple times, in several different forms. Part 1 would be released in 1986 when Harmony Gold, the company behind Robotech, purchased the rights to the film. Carl Masick, the creator of Robotech, adapted Part 1 into Robotech, The Untold Story, which he planned to distribute with the Canon Group. Masick originally intended to leave most of the footage unedited, simply changing dialogue and names to insist that the story was set in the Macross universe just after the first Entrati attack. Boss repair shop. Mark? Yeah? I need your help, Mark. God, you're supposed to be on maneuvers, aren't you? I've got a problem. 
Some kind of trouble? They may be tapping the phone. Meet me in that parking garage on Central. Now I've got to fix the speedometer. Mark! Just kidding, big buddy. I'm on my way. However, Masik was contacted by Tatsunoko and advised not to reference Macross, as they were afraid it would cause confusion with Macross Do You Remember Love, which was just being released in certain regions at that time. After removing the references to Macross, the canon group stepped in, arguing that the movie featured too much emphasis on girls and not enough action. Masik was then forced to splice in footage from the Super Dimension Cavalry Southern Cross, which led to even more problems. For one, this meant reusing footage from Robotech, which Masik was against from the start. It also led to technical issues, since Southern Cross was done in 16mm film, while Megazone was done in 35mm film. Eventually, the movie was completed and had a limited theatrical run, but was never officially released on video in the US. Masik disowned the film, and made it clear to Robotech fans that the film wasn't canon. VHS tapes were released in the UK and the Netherlands, but were discontinued in less than a year, making these tapes incredibly rare. Harmony Gold also dubbed Part 2, but this had nothing to do with Robotech, and was a faithful representation of the original Japanese, albeit changing Shogo Yahagi's name to Johnny Winters. This dub was called the International Dub, and was commissioned by the Japanese producers to use as a teaching tool in Japanese English classes, which is why all versions of it have Japanese subtitles on the bottom. B section's under 7th level restriction. Eve is the only one that can open it. Very well. Once Johnny Winters gets that message, it'll flush him out into the open. We'll play a waiting game. Carl Masick's dubbing company, Streamline Pictures, did create a faithful dub of Part 1 in 1995. However, he was unable to do dubs of Part 2 and 3 due to disputes with his distributor, Orion Pictures. Dude, give the bike back to them. You just don't get it! If they find me, you know what those bastards will do to me? It's probably useless, but I'm gonna say it. They'll spot you in a minute if you don't get rid of the bike. You gotta dump it somewhere. These people are ruthless, Mori. They murdered Shinji and I can't forget that. That same year, Manga Entertainment did an English dub of Part 3 that was released exclusively in the UK. Look. So this is it. Hey! Oh. So this is the blue diskette that's gonna open new doors for you. Finally, all three parts would eventually receive faithful English dubs when the American anime distribution company ADV Films licensed the series in 2004. If I could find the time, I would. But my job keeps me on my feet. <laughs> At McDonald's. You know, the one on Ayama Street. Megazone 2-3 is a product of its time, but despite constant references to 80s culture, it never feels dated. The idea of Megazone taking place in a simulation of the 80s actually makes it so that the references to Streets of Fire, Flashdance, the idea that McNuggets are a new item on the McDonald's menu, all seem genuine and actually make for great foreshadowing. It's a testament to how Megazone's ability to stand the test of time continues to captivate and inspire viewers, regardless of what decade or language it's released in, and hopefully will continue to for years to come. Hey!